I'm going to talk you through a Visual Basic .NET implementation of the A-Star algorithm, specifically for this graph. Let's make sure we understand what we're doing. Each of the vertices, or nodes, on this graph has grid coordinates, which you can read off the graph here. For example, D has coordinates 4, 12. And the edge between each graph has a weight or a cost. These are shown here. I'm going to use an adjacency matrix to record the details of the edges. You can see I've got the weights on there. Notice as well that this adjacency matrix is symmetrical, as you would expect for an undirected graph. So let's take a look at the code. This implementation makes use of the same vertex and graph classes as did my implementation of Dijkstra's algorithm, with a few extra properties in the vertex class specifically for use by the A-Star program. Here's my vertex class. It has a number of properties which are just public variables. You can see I've got the value, which is the payload of the vertex. In my case, it's just a letter. I've got an index number, and every vertex will have one of these, which is basically going to act as an ID. You'll see why a little later. And then I've got a couple of private variables, so these aren't really properties. These are the grid coordinates, the X and Y coordinates of the vertex. And you can see here, the vertex is maintaining its own G and F values. It also maintains its own parent. Here is a method that will return the H value. It's performing a calculation to get the Manhattan distance of a vertex from the destination. So the destination is passed in as a parameter. This is an alternative calculation which will take the X distance to the destination, square it, and then add it to the Y distance of the destination, which is also squared. And then the square root of the two gives us the Euclidean distance. The constructor of the vertex class is passed an index, a value, and the x and y coordinates. These are used to set the index and the value properties, and the two variables x and y. Here's my graph class. It's a partially object-oriented approach. I have a vertex class and a graph class, and the graph class maintains an array of vertex objects, but the graph class also makes use of an adjacency matrix, and this is a two-dimensional array of integers. So the adjacency matrix refers to each vertex by an index number. This is why I've given each vertex an index number property, to serve as an identifier that corresponds to the index number in the matrix. I'm sure I could have come up with a purely OO implementation in which my adjacency matrix was a 2D array of vertex objects, or a purely procedural one with no classes at all. But I think that this hybrid approach is quite efficient in terms of memory usage, but it's also afforded some simplicity by using objects. It lets me focus on the A-star pathfinding algorithm, which after all, is always going to require a problem-specific approach. When the graph object is first created, we set up the adjacency matrix. All we're doing here is setting all of the edges to zero. Here's the add vertex method of the graph. It puts each new vertex into an array of vertices. And here's the add edge method, which puts each edge into the adjacency matrix. This has been written for undirected graphs so two corresponding edges are added at the same time. Now, here's the code in my form, which is setting up the graph. I'm creating a new graph object, and then I'm repeatedly calling the addVertex method. For each vertex, I'm passing the index number, the payload, and the grid coordinates, which I've already worked out. And here, I'm calling the addEdge method repeatedly. It's all hard-coded for this particular graph, but if I was writing a game with multiple levels, each with a different graph, I would probably invest some time in making a better way to do this. Perhaps I could read the data from a file, or have a form that lets me drag and drop the vertices and edges into place quickly. My A star code 
has been written as a method of the graph class. It's passed the start and destination vertices and it'll return a list of strings which will be the path information I'm looking for. I have a list of open vertices here and a list of closed vertices. I could have used arrays but vb.net's list object is rather convenient. I also have a list of unvisited vertices and I'll use this vertex object to keep track of the current vertex. I start by putting all of the graph's vertices into the list of unvisited vertices. Then I take the start vertex out of this list and make it current by copying it into current vertex. The start vertex is a special case so it's handled outside of the main loop. I calculate the start vertexes g and f values. I set its g value property to zero. Of course, the distance from start to start is zero. I set the f value property by adding the g value to the h value. To get the start vertex's h value, I call its h method, which is past the destination vertex. Then comes the main loop. This will run while the current vertex is not the destination vertex. I need to work with the potential successors of the current vertex, so I'm scanning all of the vertices in the graph, but testing to see which ones share an edge with the current vertex. Notice that this for loop is using a counter variable, i, rather than scanning the vertex objects with a for each loop. I did this because the adjacency matrix is an array of integers. There's probably dozens of ways I could have approached this, but I think this is quite intuitive. So, for each neighbour, I check to see that it's neither open nor closed. Then, I remove it from the list of unvisited vertices. I add it to the list of open vertices. I set its parent to be the current vertex. And then, I add the current vertex to the list of closed vertices. The current vertex is still the same until such times it's replaced. I calculate the g and f values of the neighbour that I'm working with to see if it's a potential successor to the current vertex. I update the g and f values and the parent if the new f value is smaller than any existing one or if the existing one is zero, which means it's a brand new f value. And when we drop out of the for loop, and we've checked all of the neighbours of the current vertex, we can reassign the current vertex. This will be the one with the smallest f value. I've just set a variable called smallest f to an impossibly large value. Then I scan the list of open vertices and I replace this variable with anything smaller I come across. When I drop out of this loop, i next current gives me the one with the smallest f value. So finally, here, I'm establishing the new current vertex. And around the main loop we go again. Once we're out of the main loop, I just need to collect up the path information. The idea is that the parent of each vertex is the one that precedes it on the path. So I could do something like this. I'm getting the value of the parent of the destination. Then I get the value of the parent of the parent of the destination, and on I go. But of course, I don't know how many steps there were in the path, so I need to generate this information with a loop. I have a list of strings which will hold the path information, the payload of each vertex. Then I'm using a loop to visit each vertex's predecessor. What I end up with is the path in the wrong order, but there's a nifty little method of the list object that I can use here. I can just call it reverse method, so that'll just turn it upside down. Finally, just for good measure, I'm adding the length of the path to this list, and my function returns it. So let's see it in action. Once I've created the graph, I have a button on my form which will call the A star method. You can see here I'm declaring another list of strings which will hold the path information that comes back. I'm calling the A star method of my graph object. I pass it the start 
and the destination. So this list will contain the path information I'm looking for. And I've got a little loop here which will just scan through it and display that information. It's just building a little output string. Let's see what happens then. I have to make the graph first. And let's take a look at the path. And that looks perfect. Remember I have a formula here which calculates the Manhattan distance. I'm just going to replace that for a different heuristic, which in this case is the Euclidean distance. I'm squaring the x distance and the y distance, adding them together and then getting the square root of the two. It's a much more expensive calculation in terms of processing, but it's an alternative. Let's see what we get. I make the graph. And it's a different path this time, but it is the alternative shortest path. To see exactly how that came up, I'd really need to step through the code. But the good news is, it's correct.